In my talk today, I'll be defending the idea that Buddhist practice ought to include not just personal growth, but also social transformation. Um, I guess that's the theme for today. And I'll describe what I consider to be a Buddhist method of social transformation. Social change has not always been a significant theme in the Buddhist tradition. Of course, the Buddha gave numerous teachings to lay people, kings, as well as ordinary householders with instructions on how to establish a stable and prosperous society, and methods for taming demonic forces and transforming the world that way into a pure land have always been key Buddhist goals, especially in Tantra. And Buddhist polities have tended to idealize a stable structure in which a strong sangha is linked meritoriously to a just king. Yet the key practices on the Buddhist path tend to focus not on the transformation of the realm, but on the transformation of the individual minds of dedicated practitioners. Um, the cultivation of merit, which is key to all Buddhist traditions, benefits an individual karmic stream, especially after death. And meditative cultivation leads to individual liberation. The Buddhist renunciant famously leaves behind the dusty, chaotic social world in favor of a life conducive to moral purity. And even a bodhisattva dedicated to alleviating, alleviating suffering for all beings is generally envisioned as helping living beings attain a better rebirth in the next life, not raising up the lower rungs of society in this one. So I will not pretend that Buddhism has traditionally been dedicated to transforming society. What I do think instead is that Buddhist ideas provide excellent resources for elucidating the nature and workings of cultures. In fact, Buddhist doctrines and Buddhist practices provide a strong methodology and a strong motivation for pursuing many of the social projects underway that are geared toward increasing intercultural understanding and promoting what we call human rights. Today, my emphasis will be on how Buddhist doctrines such as no self, dependent arising, and emptiness help us understand and address the social blights of racism and misogyny. Racism, ethnocentrism, and misogyny have countless causes and conditions, and they are themselves causes of suffering of countless individuals in our world system. To even begin to speak of their causes is to acknowledge the impossible depth of their roots. They are embedded within our world in ways that make them appear intractable. I will speak of them as aspects of our shared karma, and I will mean by that both the psychological sense of karma in that they share, uh, sh they shape dispositions within the minds of individuals, and also, and this will be my main point, in the socio-cultural dimension of being cyclically recurrent, endlessly, dependently originated. Now for a Buddhist to say that something is dependently originated is to say that it does not really exist the way that it appears. What is dependently originated has no self. It is empty of any real metaphysical essential nature. Under a Buddhist view, race and gender are conceptual constructions, and I'm going to speak them of them as social constructions as well. Both kinds of constructions, psychological and social, have a certain kind of reality, a causally identifiable reality, within a given frame of reference, but both are empty from an ultimate point of view. This is conformable with uh, a Mahayana Buddhist perspective. All things are mere constructions, so the social and psychological constructions involved in race and gender are merely natural subsets of all other concepts. Such a statement puts Buddhism in line with most gender and race theorists today. That is, most theorists of race and gender agree that race and gender do not really exist in the natural world. Uh, they are cultural constructions. What is harder to defend, though it is established within the same Buddhist perspective, is the social con and conceptual nature of racism and misogyny, along with race and gender. Uh, the blights arise due to different, if related, causes and conditions, but they're still constructions. Uh, and because they are dependently originated, they are subject to impermanence. Intractable though they appear, they can and must change and eventually disappear. 
Under this view, psychological and social causes are integrated, and the impermanence of constructions is intrinsic to their dependent origination. This positions the Buddhist tradition as a useful conceptual framework for understanding race and gender dynamics, and suggests some practical methods for addressing racism and misogyny. As we'll see, the main problem, as with Buddhist practice generally, is that it is difficult and painfully slow. We'll need to look for ways to keep our eye on the horizon. In the first part of my talk, I'll discuss a passage where the Buddhist philosopher Vasubandhu affirms the conceptual construction of what we ordinarily take to be social identities in his defense of the doctrine of no self. So he was already aware of the social construction of racism. This will set up my view that we need a social understanding of dependent origination and karma. My, the, my view is that our minds are composed of social constructions. And this compromises our ability as individuals to escape bias or purify our culture of biases. In the final section of the paper, I'll move to assessing possible solutions to gender and racial bias based in a social understanding of our karmic dispositions. In the end, I'll argue that at least one component of any project to transform our social karma must be a kind of socio-cultural version of mindfulness practice. Um, to increase the skillfulness of our cultural interventions. I'll argue that academia is an institution potentially well sit situated to enact this project, so uh, I'll suggest directions for academia under that rubric, though it may uh, need to be retooled to make it, make it work. Okay. As many of you know, the great Buddhist philosopher Vasubandhu, who lived in the fourth or fifth century in India, was a crucial trans transitional figure between traditional non-Mahayana Abhidharma and the Mahayana, especially the tradition that, we would, uh, that would come to be called Yogacara. Whichever tradition we find Vasubandhu describing, though, he's always found to defend a distinction that's of great importance for every Buddhist view. The distinction between how things appear, on the one hand, and how things actually operate causally on the other. Now this is a natural distinction that doesn't take special instruction to affirm, but it's, it will be of use to note that the two contrasting concepts make you use of two distinct frames of reference. Things look one way from a certain perspective, and things are really happening causally in a different way from another perspective. It's important to note that there's a hierarchy between these perspectives. One of the perspectives is grounded within the other perspective, whereas the opposite is not true. To take the classic example, Vasubandhu says that there is no self, no soul, no Atman. But living beings believe there to be one. And the belief in the self is one perspective. Why do living beings believe in the self if there is none? Well, it's a mistaken construction grounded in a misperception of the five aggregates, the body first and also the four mental aggregates. These aggregated components are in constant flux. They have no unifying self or essence or core, but it's with reference to the aggregates that people imagine themselves to have a self. I sometimes call this a distinction between viewing of and viewing as. One experiences the aggregates, that's what you're viewing, viewing of, but then takes them to be a self. You view the aggregates as a self, so that's viewing as. Now, in his Treasury of Reasoning, Vasubandhu allows an imagined opponent to question him on this. Why, the opponent asks, are you so sure that it's the aggregates that ground the mistaken view of the self? And here he answers, and I'm going to use Charles Goodman's translation. People of ordinary intellect come to believe I am white, I am dark, I am fat, I am thin, I am old, I am young. They identify themselves with these things. Souls are not of this type. Therefore, the identification of the self has the aggregates as its object. We all know that an eternal soul is not old or young, is not thin or fat, is not white or dark. These are qualities that might be attributable to a body, but not a soul. 
If a soul can be reborn, it can take on different kinds of bodies, so it could never be white or dark, fat or thin in itself. And being old or young indicates not just a particular body, but a particular time of life for a particular body. So Vasubandhu's argument is simple and straightforward. We do, of course, think of ourselves in terms such as white or dark. He's acknowledging that. But those are qualities of aggregates, not a soul. It's a mistake to attribute this kind of quality to a self. The fallacious construction of self, then, is fundamentally a mistake whereby we grasp onto and identify with imperm impermanent com components, the aggregates. So the first 20 or 30 times that I read that passage, I assumed that when he said we ground our affection, our affection for ourselves in the aggregates, Vasubandhu was speaking entirely about the physical aggregate, the body. He says it's all the aggregates. Uh, he lists the aggregates in another section and he makes reference to the aggregates. But these qualities in particular describe the physical body. At least that's what I thought. And I felt I was sufficiently amazed just noticing that Vasubandhu and other medieval Buddhists were aware of the conceptual construction imposed upon body types. But I hadn't seen just how insightful he was. Now, thinking about this issue in the light of the widely acknowledged social construction of race, I noticed that in order for there to even be anything to ground one's identity in age and body mass and skin color, all of which are relative qualities, one needs an extremely complex range of concepts and ideas. And those ideas are internalized patterns of social expectations. One does not simply see a white body and say, I am white, because there really isn't a white body or a fat body or whatever. One needs all the aggregate groups to make the idea, I am white, come into being. It's a process that engages the whole person, because it's not simply a false construction based upon a misperception of the body. It's an interpretation of that perception in language with cultural significance. An interpretation whose erroneous characteristic traits stimulate identification because of karmic patterning embedded in the mind. But where does that karmic patterning come from? One has to have internalized a system of classifications. For Vasubandhu, dispositional states are constituted through the samskara skanda. The, uh, the impressions it sometimes translated. Erroneous biases may be attributed to past karma. We now understand that language and culture are conditioned not just psychologically, but socially. Notice that the translator here has made something of a clever choice in rendering gaura and shyama as white and dark. These are color terms, and they could just be rendered white and black. So in this passage, the passage that I cited. But that translation as white and black would imply in this context in English the racial identities associated with those terms in a way that would be anachronistic and culturally inappropriate. In addition to their use as literal color terms, the words are used in Sanskrit to indicate lightness or darkness of skin color, both as terms of beauty, the gaura beauty, shines brightly like the moon, and the shyama beauty has a glossy shine like a raven. Needless to say, in those contexts, they don't literally mean the colors white and black, and this is what might motivate the alternate translations light and dark here. So the, the rendering that Charles Goodman gives chooses one from each color. From the white and black column, he, he translates white, and from the light and dark column, he, choose, he translates dark. For me, this foregrounds the difference between our social setting and the medieval Indian one, while at the same time displaying how, in both contexts, the false reification of skin color-related identity is implicit in the terms themselves. After all, the whole point of the passage is to argue that we delusively generate our identities in dependence upon temporary appearances. White people are not really white, but also light people, if you were going to translate it that way, light people are not really light either, because people are not unitary essences. 
Buddhist no self then draws attention to the constructed nature of racial as well as other identities, but places the onus of ignorance on the individual mind. Uh, so that's Vasubandhu places it within the samskara skanda, the particular continuum within an individual mind. In a traditional Buddhist worldview, individuals share similar biases, similar perceptual and conceptual capacities because they have similar karmic conditioning. Each individual god has done something tremendously generous which allowed them to be reborn in a heavenly realm. When they look at a river, they all see nectar. Each individual hungry ghost has done something greedy which forced them into a rebirth of suffering. When they look at a river, they all see pus. The idea that our body form is a product of our deep karmic conditioning expresses the intractable nature of the bias of views. We cannot simply talk ourselves out of false conceptualization. Yet although we may have a certain genetic set of predispositions, history shows vast changes in the character and degree of human biases, even within those two terms of light and dark and how we translate them. They don't mean the same thing now as they, as they meant then. So as intractable as they are, these concepts are not hardwired. In the immortal words of Oscar Hammerstein, he says, you've got to be carefully taught. At the same time, although we're in inculcated by our caregivers, we're not simply actively taught uh, our racist biases. Implicit bias research shows racist predispositions present even when families actively work to contravene them. An accurate description of the causes of bias, including the fundamental bias that is the false reification of the self, calls for a social dimension. So with this in mind, I'd like to now turn to describe a view of karma that includes this social dimension. I hope you'll find it compelling and convincingly Buddhist. It is admittedly not a traditional view. But since it makes use of modern ideas and modern understandings, it could never have come about in pre-modern times. It's said that the Buddha in his omniscience understood the workings of karma in great detail, but the audiences for his teachings had no language in which he could describe it. Instead, he proposed the simplification of cycles of dependent origination and rebirth and many stories of past lives. We too are limited in our concepts and language, but perhaps we have a leg up on the Buddha's immediate audiences since we are comfortable speaking about political and social and discursive causes as well as psychological and physical ones. I like to imagine that if the Buddha were teaching today, he would make use of some of these additional concepts to elucidate karma. Unfortunately, this is a de degenerate age of the Dharma and the Buddha is not here. You are stuck with me as your substitute interpreter Still, I hope I can convince you that modern conceptual tools provide a newly robust and useful reading of Buddhist karma. Traditional Buddhism describes the links of dependent origination as a causal series that tracks how morally significant actions shape the mind and how the shape of the mind in turn determines the kind of body one adopts at the beginning of gestation. The kind of body one has then determines the kinds of sensations one is capable to experience. And together with, again, the shape of one's mind, this determines the range of one's reactions to those sensations. We act on our desires, but our desires are shaped and articulated by the kind of body-mind complex we have, which is the result of our karma. As Vasubandhu teaches us, karmic actions are mental actions that shape the mind. Actions in this view are always causing something, but are also always reactions, always responses to a given situation. Responses with desire or aversion and always ignorance to the perceived world. But since the world that appears, appears as it does because of our previous morally significant actions, our previous karma, we're caught within an endless cycle of self-generated, self-involved delusion. In a very real way, our nature, the characteristics of our body and mind complex, is constituted by our karma. 
And it is our karmic constituents that provide the horizon for the possibilities of our understanding and our actions. In my view, this entire structure and its powerful moral significance is robustly encompassed in a socio-cultural reading of karma. <clears throat> Excuse me. We are embedded within and in many ways constituted by our culture. When we're hungry and ready to eat, that is surely a physical sensation generated in the body. But whether we turn to look for French fries or chicken feet or something else to satisfy that desire depends upon our cultural background, our upbringing. What seems appealing, what seems appropriate, what seems desirable, what appears even as a possibility to seek as a goal for our action is constituted by our culture. Our specific intentions, the motivations for our actions, are shaped through our responses to inherited and internalized culture. Our lives, furthermore, are lived within socially constituted settings. The possibilities available to each individual and the limitations placed on each are social. As a college professor, I have relationships with other faculty, administrators, staff, and students at the institution where I teach constituted through the traditions, rules, and procedures of that institution. As members of a discipline, uh, the discipline of religious studies, I'm constituted as a colleague with certain responsibilities and expectations. As a citizen, as a spouse, as a parent, as a consumer, as a patient in a doctor's office, my identities and my place in the world are constituted socially. Which people appear to us as hostile or friendly? What kinds of behaviors are expected of us? What roles are imposed upon us are all entirely cultural. Our actions in the world take their specific meanings from these culturally constituted contexts. Our interests, our leanings, our hopes and dreams, our biases are all embedded within a nexus of cultural causes and conditions. Race and gender identities, along with every manner of status ascription, are of course also socially conditioned. When Buddhist doctrine dictates that it's our karma to be born within a poor family or a wealthy family, that status, including the very nature of wealth, is a social phenomenon. Much of what the Buddha described as karma is culturally conditioned. What I'm proposing is that we think of our cultural setting as the carrier of our karmic conditioning, and we think of our morally significant karmic actions as any actions that have consequences both within our own mental continua and within our cultural settings as well. A question that often arises from this view of karma is that of the relation between karma and responsibility. Buddhists ordinarily take our karmic conditioning to be the direct results of our own previous actions, and this makes us each individually responsible for our status and our fate. This direct connection between my actions and my experience, positive or negative, also provides the impetus to behave better for fear of karmic retrib retribution. If now I want to say that karma is present not just in the mind but in culture, <clears throat> excuse me, then I'm reaping the result of other people's actions. <clears throat> Ooh, can I drink this water? Yes, you can, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. All right, let me start that sentence over. <clears throat> if now I want to say that karma is present not just in the mind but in culture, then I am reaping the result of other people's actions and other people are experiencing the results of my actions. How, it might be asked, is this still a Buddhist view of karma? I submit that it makes more sense, both ontologically and morally, that rather than imagining that each individual mind stream inherits the results of previous actions within the same individual mind stream, we should think of an individual inheriting the endless causes of previous actions of living beings without adopting the fallacious distinction between self and other. After all, while it is certainly not the case that I'm personally responsible for the history that has brought my civilization where it is and that has allowed me to become who I am, 
The karmic approach to culture asks that we notice the ways that we do participate, intentionally or unintentionally, in causal streams with deep historical roots. When we see that we've unconsciously inherited the biases of our own culture, and implicit association tests show that these biases embed themselves deep within the structure of the mind, we cannot deny our embeddedness within our social context. The shapes our desires take are constituted by our cultural karma. The world that we inhabit was made by other living beings acting for their own purposes. Some roles are thrust upon us and some we select for ourselves. But all are drawn from a repertoire of past cultural patterns. This means that if we accept that it is our responsibility to purify ourselves, we also have to accept that it's our responsibility to purify our society. This is consonant with the fundamental Buddhist doctrine of no self, and it resonates with the universality of responsibility in the Bodhisattva path. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Jataka tales, where the Buddha tells stories of his past lives. They generally follow a standard structure in which the past story is framed by a story from the present. Someone misbehaves or some remarkable natural event occurs, and the Buddha is asked to explain the situation. This it then stimulates him to tell the story from the past. And then after he's telling the story, the Buddha provides correlations between characters in the story and various persons in the present. He'll say, for instance, at that time, Ananda was the king, Moggallana was the youngest, Sariputta was the next, and the rest of the flock of geese were followers of the Buddha, and I was the swift goose, right? Um, so you can just remember the story in your own mind. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have time to tell the whole story. It's a good story. But, and, okay, that was uh, Sarah Shaw's uh, translation, which I also recommend, her translation of the Jatakas. The story itself always contains one or more morals within it. But overall, the message is that we should not be surprised by what is happening around us. The roles that each person is playing in the world, in our world now, have been played countless times before. The universe shuffles things, so sometimes a king is king of the elephants, and sometimes a king of humans, but the relative ordered structure of identities remains for a very long time, over many, many lifetimes. Indeed, the point is apparently that as long as we continue to play these roles, we will continue to be reborn into them. The Buddhist tradition acknowledges then that we as individuals have very little impact on social structure and that the roles we play are almost uniformly repetitive and very nearly formulaic. Even the Buddha is only one of countless Buddhas who have come and will come over the eons, as depicted immediately behind me. This aesthetic of repetition is an implicit critique of all our useless striving and replaces it with a pervasive, pervasive beatific equanimity. It urges us to be patient. What more appropriate reaction could there be to an unbounded universe of trichilocosms in which uncountable Buddhas meditate? Yet, along with limitless repetition, the tradition allows for participation. There is a future Buddha identity for each of us if we make the effort. So the nature of the individual in traditional Buddhism is not very different from the suggestion I'm making, which is that we see ourselves not as individual agents making up our own story from whole cloth, but as participants in a grand project to purify the realm. Of course, we have our own mental continuum to address directly, but through it, we have access to the universe of meanings and possibilities, and we're capable to intervene and transform the realm. Modern individualism, especially in the United States, claims to, to value our specific individual contributions to social and e economic life. Excuse me. And I need to at least mention my view of personal creativity and uniqueness here just to head off some of the most trenchant critiques that might arrive from this perspective. I'll use an analogy. When my kids were younger, we used to sometimes get them sticker books to bring on a car ride. 
The books would have pictures of landscapes, and then in the back of the book would be dozens of stickers with pictures of people and animals and objects that you could put into the landscapes. And there would be themes, space stickers, Disney stickers, undersea stickers. Playing with these books is an opportunity for conformity. You can find the astronaut and put him on the moon. You can set up the tea party, all the different tea party characters with their tea. But you don't have to completely conform. You can also set up a lobster tea party on the moon, which is a bit more creative. You can stick a sticker of a cup of tea on your juice box instead of putting it in the book at all. You can put stickers all over your younger brother. <laughs> but whether you're putting the stickers in their expected place or doing something new with them, you're making use of the work of a number of other people. An artist, a book designer, a publisher, a printing company, and to the extent that you're sticking stickers anywhere at all, you're more or less building upon their intentions. There's more to say here about specifics. No matter where you stick the sticker, you're directly extending the intentions of the inventor of the adhesive. But perhaps putting the astronaut sticker on your brother's nose is diverting away from the intention of the designer who chose to include a moonscape backdrop. To be more specific still, we could imagine that maybe the designer was completely content with the idea that kids should stick stickers anywhere and everywhere. That's what kids do with stickers. But there was at least a momentary evaluation that there should be a moonscape backdrop as a natural environment for the astronaut, and that intention is countered by placing the astronaut on the brother's nose. That's what makes it funny. As human beings, we are awash with complex and often contradictory intentions. But any given intention, to the extent that we act on it, becomes available for others to extend or confute. We have a repertoire of words and expressions and behaviors and roles handed down to us by our caregivers, and it's expected that we will make use of them in ways that the randomness of the world yields unpredictable. But that does not counter the fact that we have inherited a set of highly designed stickers that were constructed with particular contexts in mind. The history of language, the history of the world, is replete with changed meanings and repurposed identities. But we're always building with materials that are themselves robustly constructed. Whether we want it or not, the meaning of our lives is constituted through countless prior actions whose results have become actions available to us actions in which and in response to which we are participating in the story of all living beings. If when I say whether we want to or not, it feels like this view is forcing us into a trap, and if this begins to seem unjust and claustrophobic, well, that is to see the nature of samsara. We are trapped by the modes of meaning making that are available to us, and it's only by progressing on the path and increasing our awareness of those causes and conditions that have brought us to be where, as we are, that we can gain an understanding of our karma and eventually loosen its control over us. Unfortunately, the world of suffering is poisoned by the countless past actions of living beings acting out of ignorance. One reason I became convinced of the viability of looking at karma socially is that studies of the persistent social blights, like racism and sexism, often reflect the kind of patterning familiar in the Buddha's teachings of dependent origination. And I think we're seeing a lot of these patterns across our talks today. Subconscious biases are unconditioned, in are conditioned rather, in part by watching biased news reports, which are shaped by reporters who themselves are poisoned by subconscious biases, reporting on police actions performed by biased police. Cycles of discrimination and poverty abound. Discriminatory income disparities, just to give one quick example, keep families from acquiring the wealth and credit needed to gain loans necessary to get out of poverty. Another concept that resonates with the dependent origination is the notion of a cultural backlash or the idea of a pendulum swinging back and forth after being pushed too far in one direction. 
As the feminist philosopher Kate Mann has argued, the word misogyny is something of an error if it is taken to mean literally hatred of women. A misogynist doesn't necessarily hate all women. A misogynist might be very close with his mother or something. Rather, to be a misogynist is to enact a social role, specifically the role of punishing women who are deemed overly independent and insufficiently supportive of men. A dangerous result of feminist and civil rights advances, then, appears to have been that they trigger subconsciously embedded social roles. Backlash, in this sense, is a particularly distressing notion, since it suggests that progress may be undone by an unperceived undercurrent. Of course, the notion of a pendulum swinging back and forth can be reassuring when things are not going one's way. And I'm personally supportive of progressive politics, even in the face of subconscious bias and potential backlash. But the key question that surfaces from such causal patterns is whether there is a way to act more skillfully to root out the blight without triggering a backlash. It may actually, distressingly, be even more difficult than simply figuring out a strategy for intervention. After all, if we all if all we have are distorted sticker books passed down to us from our biased ancestors, how can we change things so that even if we may not be redeemable, the next generations receive a different set of possibilities? Buddhist karma theory is consequentialist in, the act, in that actions are considered virtuous or non-virtuous based on the positive or negative consequences that arise from them. But the understanding of karma we've been discussing makes the moral assessment of our actions both more complex and more realistic than ordinary consequentialism. There are many kinds of results that come from a given action and many ways in which any given action may be seen to participate in diverse causal streams. The Buddha alone sees the workings of karma and our Buddha taught that action based on ignorance leads to further suffering. This is perhaps why he suggested that moral purification required a very narrow, secluded lifestyle. If there's no way to mitigate backlash, then social transformation may indeed be impossible, and monasticism might present itself as the only way to purify, uh, to cultivate purity. This is the truth of suffering, the pessimistic side of Buddhism. But our most intractable social problems do change and develop, which means that they are impermanent. I will not accept that it's impossible to purify our cultural karma, to transform the realm. So to turn to the optimistic side, we need to remember the truth of the path. The Buddha did in fact suggest how we can address our most intractable problem, which is the distorted cravings of our own mind, our own minds. To root out the kleshas, he prescribed, among other things, shamatha and vipassana, that is, concentration and introspective attention practices. These are contested terms, but at a minimum, they enhance the cultivation of mindfulness, which helps us circumvent our distortions, see things more accurately, and on that basis, learn to intervene to prevent the worst of our negative habits. The basic goal of such meditation is, again, at a minimum, to replace negative habits with positive ones. But this works not simply by declaring the intention, though that is essential. One must also spend a good deal of time just looking, without judgment and without any agenda, at the ordinary flawed workings of the mind. One needs to observe the karmically established patterns of one's own mental stream before one can determine the best ways to intervene skillfully. So how then can a society become mindful? Since biases are embedded in social, con in social structures, as well as in the subconscious, no individual can be trusted to the solitary work of rooting out biases. It must be a joint project, an institution dedicated to cult cultivating careful, non-judgmental social introspection, in quotations. It must be free of any agenda beyond the pursuit of clarity and understanding. And it must be capable of constantly renewing itself so that it can shed the biases of previous structures. It should be modular with many independent subunits attacking the problem from multiple, perspect multiple perspectives as they arise. Psychological roots of bias and distortion need to be addressed along with social ones. And the social causes need to be understood in historical as well as structural terms. The nature of language 
and the implicit ideas that are embedded in other cultural forms, in cultural forms of every kind, need to be discussed and evaluated. So perhaps it has already dawned upon you that this project falls under, at least potentially, under the general purview of academia, in particular the humanities and the social sciences. In the laboratory of the academy, scholars develop intellectual tools to assess with cool composure the causes and conditions of every kind of suffering, however hot. The various methods of the humanities and social sciences are intended, at least by some of their practitioners, to reveal in distinct modes the nature of our social realities, how they inhabit our bodies and minds, and how we inhabit them. Remember that Vasubandhu taught us that things appear one way from a deluded perspective, whereas they're actually caused another way. In fact, the various disciplines reveal many modes of appearance and many modes of causality. We speak about research for its own sake, but this is best understood as a rule of thumb intended to prevent the biases of ostensibly practical work from distorting our direct inquiry into the objects of study. In truth, we hope that with our basic primary research, we can reveal eventually ways of improving life for everyone. Studying and teaching the constructed nature of identity and the historical patterns of bias, for instance, are already fields of study with deep and lasting impacts on society. If we trust the pattern of mindfulness for the mind, this kind of research can help us change as individuals and eventually as societies. Simply looking with care and concern upon our societies helps us better understand what is working and what is not. So one final component that I think is missing that could dramatically improve the effectiveness of the academy in combating our worst social ills only occurred to me when I considered how traditional Buddhist ethics centers around the adoption of vows. And this is what I'll end with, as Professor Adamak mentioned. Whether one is a lay follower of the Buddha or a monk, a bodhisattva or a tantric practitioner, one's moral progress is accelerated crucially by the adoption of specific vows. It's, a very good, it's very good to refrain from killing living beings, for instance. It's, it's good. But to do so after having taken a vow, even for a single day, is, the Buddha teaches, far more meritorious. Why should this be? I think it's because vows structure individual identities so as to conform with particular moral systems. Take, a, uh, take the example of not eating meat uh, in a given meal. Am I out of time? Oh my gosh, for my whole thing? Oh, just for my, my just but not Q&A? Oh yeah, thank you, okay, that's good. I, I think I'm gonna make that. Okay, so take the example of not, thank you. <laughs> take, uh, take the example of not eating meat in a given meal as opposed to not eating meat as a vegetarian. If I'm a vegetarian, which is to say I've effectively taken a vow not to eat meat, then every time I eat, I'm reinforcing a moral habit and an identity. Every meal has an effect on my mind and my self-understanding, on my self-control. On, self on the other hand, if I'm not a vegetarian, the one meal without meat might save the life of the same chicken. But after it's over, it might have the opposite mental result. I might find myself even more predisposed than usual to have meat at my next meal. There are social effects as well as psychological ones. If I make my vow public, it makes my behavior a potential model for others, and I can benefit by having my vegetarianism reinforced by living with other vegetarians. The point is that simply taking ourselves to be acting in accordance with a given conceptual scheme or identity alters the psychological and social effects of our actions. What's Buddhist about vows specifically is that they provide a method of shaping the mind and through the mind, the world, by structuring the intentionality of our actions, by thinking of ourselves in a particular way. Vows help us condition our own future propensities and capacities by deciding to read our actions in accordance with particular identity constructions. This is an additional karmic fact that reveals social forces in the shaping of our identity constructions. 
and knowing about it may help us to come to understand something about race and gender identities as well. But the, reasoning I, the reason I bring up the point here is that if we trust the effectiveness of vows, then the explicit declaration that the purpose of academia, or at least one of its central purposes, is the improvement of society, ought to accelerate the process. Either way, it may be a painfully gradual process, but I think there's hope for a real transformation of our complex shared karma. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Go. Yeah, it is really a lot of, if we want to make a change in the society, really it's a lot of things that we have to talk about ourselves. And then we give it up to you, the esteemed scholars, to push us toward progress. This is a way to do this, so it's a way to change the society. This is a way to change the society. And then we can do this, and then we can do this, and then we can do this, and then we can do this. 然后，如果你有问题，呃，电话已经开了。如果现在对大家口的讲题有任何问题的话，就可以举手。嗯 ，Before the question comes, I'll respond to your point, which is a, which is generous to say that we should be pushing you, but. Um, part of my talk is about how we should be pushing ourselves and we should, uh, academics should uh, have, be more aware of the social impact of our work. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. It's really uh, amazing to hear. Uh, I think it helps me at least clarify many of the things that I've been thinking recently about dealing with the social problems that we're facing. Uh, and in particular, in the past week, finding out some awkward things about the Haiti Prime Minister um, past actions. Um, so, my question stems from the moment when you said, you may be thinking at this time, that this is a perfect role for the Academy. Mm -hmm. Actually, at that exact moment, I was thinking, gee, this sounds an awful lot like DDM founder Shannon Fashu's idea of uplifting the character of humanity yeah. and building a career on Earth. Right, I got the wrong audience. <laughs> well, I don't think you got the wrong audience, <laughs> but um, it leads me to think, oh, maybe there's a strong similarity between uh, perhaps a traditional role played by uh, monasteries and contemporary role played by universities. Yeah. Perhaps, in some sense, uh, the monastic practitioners are nowadays to be compared with uh, professors at the university. Yeah. I was wondering if you thought about this, um, <laughs> how, how can we encourage ideas to leave the academy and, and bring them to everyday life? Uh, can we yeah, thank you. Um, yesterday, so the answer is yes, yesterday I, I gave a talk uh, to a group of scholars in uh, Buddhist philosophy and I was um, reminding them that the first universities were Buddhist institutions uh, So, and that Nalanda uh, from the middle of the first millennium till the turn of the 13th century, uh, housed a great diversity of uh, scholars studying from many different perspectives um, in a diverse curriculum. Um, so for, for many, many centuries, this was a Buddhist model of learning. Um, and so I, I think we should see, I mean, and I was making the argument that we should see um, this, this kind of study as a Buddhist practice, as a practice for cultivating um, ourselves and cultivating the world. Um, and I think that Buddhists should see uh, learning uh, uh, in all of the disciplines, um, uh, but especially in the humanities and social sciences, as a natural adjunct to trying to understand uh, how we can act in the world effectively and how we can be, you know, bodhisattvas uh, or, or near bodhisattvas, right? Um, because the bodhisattvas studied everything, uh, according to the Mahayana Sutra Alankara. Uh, over the course of many lifetimes, um, all the sciences were cultivated to perfection. Uh, that's why they're able to intervene in so many different ways.
Any more questions? Yes, thank you so much. Um, and about academia, um, I'm sure you're just as familiar as I am with this constant lament we have now that um, we're, as we experience the push to um, instrumentalize all of our um, um, processes of teaching. And one of the, it seems apparent that the very functions that you would have us promote, uh, such as keeping alive the past, becoming aware of how things are constructed, being critical of our own role in, in construction, that these, this is precisely what uh, is under pressure that makes us a, a kind of target because that is that very function uh, counters it, it creates people who are going to question um, mm. you know the paradigm of blame and creating separate communities to blame mm. our, our suffering so you know what how do we deal with that that pressure yeah, that's a, a very serious and significant problem. And I think it's one way to think about that problem is to just notice the way that um, the uh, movement, the postmodernist movement, uh, began uh, as this very exciting and energizing, revelatory um, description of how uh, we're seeing all kinds of new things just by taking a critical perspective. We're able to notice that our intellectual uh, disciplines uh, have all been plagued by uh, ethnocentrism and racism in various, uh, in various varieties and sexism and, and have been selective throughout history in, in noticing things. Uh, but that has soured and turned into now a kind of um, uh, um, fear of criticism and a fear and a sort of lip fear of actually making a statement um, but also uh, a generalized principle that now we know that actually there's no such thing as progress uh, in the humanities or in social sciences, that actually it's all just about uh, our own personal uh, uh, aspirations uh, and our own limited uh, lenses on the world. Um, so I'm trying to make the argument that we should see it actually as progress when we notice these kinds of uh, biases, um, that that's, what, that's where we see, that's one area where we see progress. We see progress in many areas of our scholarship when we know new things that we didn't understand before, but we also have stepped back from the idea of progress uh, in the academy to a large degree, in, at least in the humanities to a large degree. And I think it's, uh, we should take a little bit more pride in the recognition that we do, we are more careful with our discourse now. And we're more aware of uh, race and gender as the themes of my, uh, of my talk um, than we were. Uh, and we can tell that. And it's possible that there's, you know, that there's backlash and there's, there's problems that are caused by that new awareness. Um, but it seems like that's progress. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the one of the things that the Buddhist tradition teaches us is that, yes, everything is ultimately empty. Uh, all things are ultimately um, devoid of essential natures, and therefore all of our constructions are limited. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we don't have conventions that are useful. Um, so I think we should have the confidence that we can see when there are benefits to our uh, advancements and our changes in discourse, uh, and we should raise up our own um, uh, scholarship and our traditions um, when we see those advances. And I think you know advances in critical thought are absolutely key to that. <laughs>